Ruchem Abayim. Again, thank you very much for attending. Um, this lecture tonight on my uh, thoughts is going to be something on Purim. Again, I see the Purim as the word can be broken up into poor him. So I'm going to develop a whole idea. I've never really looked at Purim the way I have this year. It's amazing. This will be a double lecture. And uh, we'll lead into it at the beginning of this lecture. And then uh, next week we'll be heavy into explaining something, hopefully some new ideas that really you never thought about, and the importance uh, of Esther and all that we deal with it. Now, so next Thursday night and Friday, we will be celebrating the holidays of Purim. It's been a long, hard year. We've had to spend our holidays, for the most part, separated from our families and friends. We are, God willing, getting closer to some real solution, but we're really not still there yet. We can hope and pray that just like Purim of the past was a source of salvation for the Jewish people, so too this Purim should become a source of salvation for our present situation. We have to ask ourselves, if nothing in the world is an accident, again, what is God trying to tell us, especially during this time of the year? Are there any lessons that we can and should learn from the ancient story of Purim that can help us to navigate our lives today? As it says in Pirkei Avot, chapter 2, Mishnah 10, Rabbi Shimon said, Roa es which translates to mean look into the past so you'll be, you will be able to navigate the future. We have spent a good part of this year sequestered with ourselves and our families, and hopefully we have used the time wisely. Life can move so fast and can be so demanding that many times we just don't have the time to stop and smell the flowers. Well, God hit the pause button. He forced us to look within, within ourselves, within our families. We've had time to reflect on our past, examining who and what we are trying to organize the clutter that we call our minds. Hopefully we've come to the realization that many of the things that we thought before this pandemic were so important, somehow, now really don't matter. But those godly values, family, truth, charity, community, and prayer, they stand out even higher than they did before. So does, so does our need for peace, <laughs> that elusive butterfly. God has brought this pandemic on the world with a good reason. We live in the most affluent period in the world's history. There was only one, one other time in history that could match our wealth and success. That was the era just before the flood. Humanity was blessed with long life, health, wealth, and time. In fact, the earth was so fertile that they planted only once in 40 years. So what happened? We learn from history that one of the hardest tests a man can be tested with is affluence. When people are poor and oppressed, they naturally turn to God and religion. But somehow, when people are blessed with prosperity and affluence, they feel they really don't need God. They feel like self-made men that worship their Creator. The end of the story, will all, by, pardon me, the end of the story we all know: God brought a flood and destroyed the world. I believe that this pandemic has been a wake-up call. The clock is ticking. We need to wake up. We can't just keep hitting the snooze button. Generally, we look to our leaders for guidance. How do you think that's working out? The leaders of the secular world seem to be totally lost. The United States, the country that is heralded as a world leader, can't keep law and order on the streets of its own cities in Congress. What an embarrassment. I don't care which party you belong to. Grown adults acting like spoiled children. Politics, much like life, used to be based on the art of compromise. Well, guess what? That art has long been dead and buried. So where is the answer? I believe the answer resides within each and every one of us. We have all been created with a spark of divinity. We have a godly soul. We just need to work on delving deep into our essence and reveal all the goodness that resides there. 
up until this point, I think that God has encouraged us to look within, working on the me. He forced us to look into the mirror. And then he asked each one of us a question. Are you content with what you see? So, how many of us can answer in the affirmative? However, if you haven't figured it out yet, the solution is not in the me. But the answer exists when we turn the me over into the we. The only way that we grow is if we can get past ourselves. Within ourselves, we are limited. If we can move outside of ourselves, huh, the possibilities are endless. Help someone else. Comfort someone else. Listen to their pain. Offer financial support or, or try to find someone who can and will. This is one of the greatest lessons of the story of Purim. Poor him. The ability to look past one's own needs and desires and see someone else's pain. Poor him. Having the strength of character of putting others' needs before your own. Poor him. We see the story of Esther. She had been forced to live her life married to an evil and barbaric person such as Akashverosh. She was a refined, righteous woman, a prophetess, living with Mordechai. The last thing that she wanted to be <laughs> was Queen of Persia. From the story, we can see the long hand of time. There are many things that are hidden from us, but to God Almighty, everything is connected. Time and space do not affect his existence. The whole story doesn't begin here with Haman and Mordechai, no. The story really begins with the Jews being redeemed from Egypt. They were on their journey traveling through the desert, on their way to Mount Sinai. There, they were to receive the Torah from God Almighty himself. On the way, they were attacked by the nation of Amalek, descendants of Esau. In the battle that ensued, God allowed Yeshua only to weaken Amalek, but they were not totally defeated. God said that it would only happen in the future. And so it was that the first king of Israel, Shaul, was commanded to wipe out the nation of Amalek. He went to battle and he was victorious. He wiped out the whole nation, men, women, children, everyone, <laughs> everyone, except their king, Agog. He lived one more night. That night, he had relations with a slave woman from that encounter, she became pregnant and gave birth. The results of King Shaul's misdeed? Haman. The arch enemy of the Jews was born. And so too the seed for the story of Purim was planted. It happened that Esther happened to be of royal blood. She was a descendant of King Shaul, the first king of Israel. Mordechai was a descendant of Shimei ben Gerah. Now this too is important in that it was Shimei who cursed and threw stones at King David when he was running from his son, Avshalom. David's men wanted to kill Shimei on the spot for his insolence to the king. But David said no. Somehow David knew that, that Mordechai, one of the heroes of the story of Purim, would be Shimei's descendant. Again, the long hand of time. Years before, Cyrus, King Cyrus, had given permission to the king, pardon me, to the Jews, to begin the construction of the second temple. However, when Achishverosh became king, he halted the construction. Achishverosh had married Vashti. She was the granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon. He married her so that his, so that his kingship would have royal blood, since he himself was a commoner. It was she who convinced him to halt the building of the temple. God had her pay dearly for her advice. She paid with her head. She was a vicious anti sampite She had her Jewish handmaiden serve on the Shabbat in the nude. God always has the punishment fit the crime. So she was summoned by Achishverosh on the Shabbat. He ordered her to appear before him and all the assembled guests in the nude. She refused. Achishverosh in his drunken stupor asked his advisors, what to do about her disobedience. She had ridiculed and ignored his direct command. She had said that she was a princess of royal blood, and he was only a commoner. Haman, the lowest of the king's seven advisors, jumped in and suggested 
that it was not it was the king's obligation to show his subjects that a man is the king of his home. It was his suggestion that cost Vashti her life. It's strange. He was the only one of the king's advisors, foolish enough to speak. Everyone else was afraid that the king might have a change of mind and then Vashti would get her revenge. As we see fools rush in where wise men never go. The banquet that cost Vashti her life was thrown by Achishverosh in the third year of his reign. The reason for the celebration was that he thought that the prophecy of Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, stating that the Jews would return to their homeland and rebuild their temple in 70 years, according to his calculations, had expired, and so he was celebrating that fact. His party lasted for 180 days, an excessive display of opulence. At the party, he himself wore the golden vestments of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. He even had his assembled guests use the golden vessels of the temple to drink their wine. It was a celebration that seemed to spell the end of the Jewish nation once and for all. After the national festive festivities ended, the king then had a special seven-day celebration for the citizens of his capital city of Shushan. Everyone, everyone was invited, even the Jews. Ah, the patriotic Jews. They came to Akashvero's feast. They ate, they drank, and they were part of the celebration. God didn't look kindly on their participation in the festivities. After all, celebrating the fact that Jeremiah's prophecy did not come true? Huh. They should have seen it as a time of sadness, not joy. A time of mourning, not celebrating. However, we know that one of God's greatest traits is called Erech long-suffering. He always gives us time to repent before he inflicts the punishment. It is God's hope to wipe out the sin, not the sinner. So why weren't they threatened with extermination sooner? After all, it was after nine years. They were sustained by a great merit. Esther was known to all the Jews of Shushan, yet not one person, not one person told the king what he so desperately wanted to know. Who was Esther's family? What was her nationality? Mordechai had instructed, instructed her not to reveal her nationality. And Megillah does not tell us why. We do know that Achish Ferris was very, very interested. He tried all kinds of ploys to get her to tell him. With Mordechai's suggestion then, he even organized another search for another wife, hoping to get her to reveal her origin and family in jealousy. But she still refused. But why? Why was he so interested? The fact was, interestingly enough, that she actually ruled over him. He had no leverage over her. She could do more or less as she pleased. And the only thing he could do was force himself on her physically or kill her. But that was not his wish. He wanted to rule over her, dominate her. If he had known who her family and nation were, then ah, he could have lav lavished them with gifts or even threatened to hurt them in some way, if she did not agree to do any and all of his demands. He wanted to know. He needed to know. Can you imagine how much money he would have paid an informer for that information? But no one came forward. It was as if she belonged to every nation, and at the same time, to no nation. You know, I would like to end this part of my thought with a question. Why is the book that we read called Megillus Esther, the story of Esther? Why not Mordechai and Esther, or Esther and Mordechai? So one simple answer would be that the whole story has already had already been entered into the annals of Persian history. In addition to that, she was the queen. So of course she would be mentioned. But I think there's a much, much more here that we can glean from. Who was Mordechai? Mordechai was a prophet. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Supreme Court. He was a leader of the generation. In the story of Purim, he plays, though, a much different role. In the story, he is Esther's mentor. He has groomed her from the moment of birth for a mission much greater than either one of them could ever have imagined. 
the survival of not just those Jews that were alive at that time, but the actual survival of Judaism as a whole into perpetuity. Haman, even worse than Hitler, may his name be obliterated, wanted to kill on one day, on one day, every Jewish man, woman, and child. He wanted to wipe Jews and Judaism out of existence forever. Only one thing stopped him. The strength and the resolve of one woman. Can you imagine what it was like for her to stand alone after fasting for 70 hours straight? No, no, no bread, no water, nothing. And then to stand before the evil Haman who wanted to destroy her. Standing before the assembled nobility and her barbaric evil husband, whose feelings for her were at best uncertain. When she stumbled, when she was a bit insecure, Mordecai was there to give her the words of encouragement that she needed. But once she found her inner strength, that peace of God that resides within each and every one of us, she never stumbled again. She was strong and resolute. One woman, one woman against an empire, and she won. What a lesson for us. We do not have the permission to give up or take a break. Life was made to live. That's our mission. To connect to the source, as it says that a servant of a king is a king. And as it says in Psalm 100, If do us Hashem simple, serve God in joy. We need to look forward to the time when we can once again hug and kiss each other, share simchas, weddings, bar mitzvahs, circumcisions together, to just be able once again to see smiles. We always need to remember that even on a cloudy day, the sun is still shining. God is always smiling down on us, though it may be hard at times to understand. Please turn in next week, tune in next week, when we will explore how the story and the backdrop develop, and we'll see how important and why the Megillah is called Esther, and how key she is, this one woman who has saved Judaism forever. God bless and be well, and with that, we should bring in the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly in our time. Again, thank you very much for attending. Have uh, hopefully next week again on Thursday night. The McGill will be read. There will be a class on Wednesday. Please attend. You'll find it very, very interesting. Some ideas I've never thought about before, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy. It. God bless and be well. Be safe. Be happy. Shabbat shalom.